Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. The idea of the Trinity, that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are somehow a single entity, is a central tenet to Christianity. Was it always this way? If not, where did the idea come from, and how and why did it become so important? Before we get to that, Bart, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing well, thanks. I'm, uh, you know, this is a good day for me because uh, you and I are recording a couple of these things, three of these things today, which is, it's, these things are so much fun for me. I don't know, but I just really love doing this kind of thing. But then after it, when we're done, I'm off tonight. I've got a, I've got a blog dinner. So, you know, I've got this, we've got this, the Barterman blog. And when I'm in different places, I'll get together with people who are on the blog just to have a dinner. And uh, so I'm in London still and we was in, uh, in Wimbledon and we'll, uh, I'm getting uh, eight people together and we're going to have, we're going to have a pint and then uh, have a dinner and uh, just talk, talk about blog stuff, <laughs> stuff about the New that Testament. That sounds like Early a Christian. lot of fun. And it's always great because there's such interesting people on the blog and they, you know, there, it's a, you know, there are a lot of people on the blog. I don't get to meet, meet most of them, but every time I meet them, their stories are just amazing. It's great. I really enjoy it a lot. So anyway, so I'm looking, so it's a good day for me today. How about, how about you? How's your day looking? Busy. Good, good, but busy. Um, We've got children swimming lessons and then taking them to daycare and nursery. And then I'm teaching Sumerian tonight. So I have a lesson what? I need to prep for. Yes, it's a, it's a long day. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Fun. Teaching nice Sumerian. I think things. I'd rather be drinking a pint with my blog people <laughs> than teaching Sumerian. But maybe, uh, you know, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. So we did the the very introductory class before I went to the UK. And now once I come back, came back we got into like the more intermediate class so i teach for half the lesson and then the other half we just go through translations together um which is actually i'm really enjoying it because i'm translate like we're translating through a, a gudea statue that's in uh, in the louvre and it's it's been a long time since i actually sat down and translated gudea and it's it's really fun what translated what gudea? so gudea he was a, a a king of mesopotamia but he's very well known, comparatively speaking, because he left all of these statues um, depicting huh. himself with building inscriptions on, and, and there are some actually really long texts about him building temples and and that Whoa. kind of thing. Okay, well, not well known to New Testament scholars, but okay. <laughs> well, th th this is true. This is true. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, good. Okay. Well, that does sound fun, actually, translating texts. Yeah. 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 No, it's it's yeah. it's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but going away from Gudea and, and my excitement about Sumerian, we are talking about the Trinity today. And I think the easiest place to start is what is the doctrine of the Trinity? Yeah, it, it, it's it's the easiest and also the most complicated, as it turns out, because I think a lot of people don't really understand the Trinity. A lot of people think that if you say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, and it's not. The doctrine of the Trinity does say that there's there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But the doctrine has to do with how they relate to each other. Because you could believe in Father, Son, and Spirit without having the doctrine of the Trinity. And many people have, and many people still do. The doctrine of the Trinity is that all three of those figures, God, God the Father, uh, Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three of those figures are God. But it's not just that they're God. They are equally God. All of them are equally God. There's not a hierarchy. They're made of the same substance, uh, and they they have the same power. They are they are equal. Um, they are different from each other. There are three different ones who are all God, but or and those three are one God. So there are three persons in the Godhead. Uh, three distinct persons, they are equal, and the three distinct people, persons who are equal are one God. So it's three and one. And people say, well, wait, um, that math don't work. <laughs> or they say, man, that doesn't make any sense. And well, that's right. The math does not work. And it's not meant to make, uh, you know, Aristotelian sense. Uh, it's meant to, it's a mystery. Um, and it is so mysterious that if you think you understand it, you don't understand it. 
I mean, it's, 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 you can't, it doesn't really equate, but that's, that's the affirmation. Three God, three, three persons, one God, one God, not three gods. Does this idea appear anywhere in the Bible? <laughs> well, short answer, no. <laughs> uh, you certainly get um, you get references to uh, divine being. You get references, of course, to God, the Creator. You get references to Christ being God, and you get references to the Spirit uh, as a divine being. So the Spirit of God is a God. It's a God being. Um, but you don't have you don't have anywhere in the Bible that says it comes out and says that the three are equal in substance. And you don't have anywhere in the Bible that says that that the, there are three of these beings, but there's only one God. Uh, there's one passage that has traditionally been used in order to, the, the most important passage has been traditionally used to argue that the Bible supports the Trinity. It's in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. It's um, called by scholars the, uh, the Johannine Kama. A comma means a, a short piece of uh, writing that's not a full sentence. But the, the Johannine comma in 1 John in the King James Bible and Bibles related to the King James, based on late manuscripts of the Bible, say um, that there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. Okay. So that's that's pretty close. I mean, it doesn't say the three are all equally God and they're the same substance, but it does say the three are one, and that's the doctrine of the Trinity. The problem is that um, that that verse was not originally in the New Testament. Um, this is not a debated point among uh, among scholars. This is one of those textual changes that everyone, just about everybody, except for except for very very hardcore fundamentalists, agree it wasn't originally there. It's only found in much later. Uh, manuscripts. It doesn't start showing up in Greek manuscript for many centuries, <laughs> over a thousand years after the book was in circulation. Some scribe added that bit. Um, so, uh, so there's nowhere that it's explicitly stated. My understanding is that the idea of the Trinity came about as an answer to a theological question. If God explicitly states that he is the only God, how then do we reconcile that with Jesus' divinity and the presence of the Holy Spirit? Is that a fair understanding or does it need some nuance? Yeah, well, the nuance takes about three volumes of six hundred pages each. <laughs> it's a, it's a very serious issue, um, but it's a it's an imp the basic point is very Im important that that the um, the idea behind the Trinity is based in the Bible, even though the Trinity is not found in the Bible. The doctrine isn't found in the Bible, but the doctrine emerges out of certain biblical statements um, that Trinitarians maintain. Uh, have to be explained by the doctrine of the Trinity. And it begins with the idea that there's only one God. And you get that, uh, the passage you're quoting, you get passages like that in the book of Isaiah, um, the second part of Isaiah, where God, God himself says, I alone am God, there is no other, okay? one God. Um, or in the book of Deuteronomy, sometimes translated chapter six of Deuteronomy, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You know, and so so the idea of the oneness of God is central. But also in the Bible, in the New Testament, you have references to Jesus uh, being God. And then uh, Jesus equates the spirit to himself as an equal kind of being to himself. And so you get these three individuals in the Bible that are all called um, God. But the very strong monotheistic emphasis uh, that develops within Judaism and, and then Christianity, that there's only one God. And so how do you explain it? That's, that's what drives people to try and figure out a, a, a way to make it possible for there to be only one God, but to have three beings that are God. And the Trinity was just one answer to this question. How did non-Orthodox Christian groups deal with the problem? And did they all actually see it as a problem? Uh, yeah, it's a good question whether they saw it as a problem. There, there were some people did. The thinkers really did. I think probably in the early church, it was like today. Most people don't even think much about it. You know, they don't they don't try and work it out. They just you know they think that Christ is God and God is God and there's one God. You know, they think think like that. It was, it, but it was a problem early on in Christianity, and there were lots of debates about it. One way there there are various ways of solving the problem. One way to solve it is to say Jesus and the Spirit aren't really God. Um, that, you know, that, that 
it's metaphorical language when they talk about being divine, you know, like, uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, sirloin steak is divine, you know, something like, it's like a Christ is divine. No, it's not, that means really divine. So you could say that he's not really, not really God, um, or the spirit's not really God. That's one way to deal with it. But, but most people by the second century who are Christian are, most people are saying Christ is God. And so in the second century, in the early centuries, it's really about Christ and God the Father. Uh, and the Spirit ends up getting added on because of certain elements within Christianity and in, in the Bible. But the issue is how can Christ be God and God be God But if there's one God? And there were a number of solutions to that in the second century that were propounded and believed by a lot of people who were Christian. Uh, so that, for example, there were some people who said, some people said that, um, that Christ was God because God made him God. Um, this is what I, I think is probably the very earliest understanding of Christ, is that when, when he, after he died and was raised from the dead, he was exalted up to God's right hand. And in the ancient world, if somebody, if a human is taken up to heaven to live with the gods or to live with God, that makes them a divine being. And so in that understanding of things, the um, uh, Christ was a human who was elevated to a divine status. So he's not equal with God. Oh, my God. No, of course he's not equal with God, but, he's, uh, but he is a divine being, and the Spirit would be a divine being. So, that, so that, that's a kind of subordinationism. That, that idea is that God, uh, um, Christ is subordinate to God, but not equal. And so he would have been created at some point, and the Spirit would have been created at some point, and they're not equal with God. Um, are there any other solutions that were thought of to answer this question? Yeah, some of them were uh, very popular and for a while were, were the solution. There was a solution that was, uh, was um, very common at the end of the second century um, that was held, the, held widely by lots of people, including apparently bishops of Rome uh, who were, you know, so today we'd call them the Pope. They weren't called popes yet, but these would be the, the early popes who held this view. We know this because the enemies of this view admit it. <laughs> and um, this view is called a number of different things. Uh, the term I tend to use is modalism, modalism. And it's called, I didn't invent that term, that's just the term. But the, the term modalism refers to God existing in three modes of existence. This is a way to solve the idea that the three are one. And the idea behind it is that I, I myself, Bart Ehrman, I am, uh, I am um, the son of of someone, and I am the uh, brother of someone, and I am the father of someone at the same time. These are three distinct roles, being a son, a brother, and a father. Um, but there's only one of me. Um, and so I'm not three different beings. I'm one being in three different roles. And the idea is that God the Father, God the Son, the Spirit are all three modes of God's existence. And so, you know, as father, he's the almighty who runs the world. And as the son, he's the one who becomes a, an incarnate being for the salvation of the world. As the spirit, he's the one who's among us now to, to guide our lives. And so it's all the same God, but it's in three distinct modes of existence. That solves the problem. Then you've got, you got these three people. They're all God, but they're all just modes of the same thing. This view as I said, it was hugely popular, but it got demolished by theologians at the end of the second and end of the third century. Demolished, at least in the eyes of people who didn't hold to it. <laughs> um, these theologians, especially somebody named, uh, there's a figure named Tertullian, who was a very feisty and interesting uh, and witty uh, author, who, um, who called this view patripassionism. <laughs> patripassionism, it's a great word. Uh, Patri from the word pater, father, passion from the word to suffer. And what Tertullian said, look, if you think that these are three modes of existence, you're saying that the father got crucified, that the father died. You can't kill God, <laughs> the father. And so he made fun of these people and called them pater passionists. And he said things like the father can't be his own son. The son can't be his own father. <laughs> father, you can have a father and you can have a son, but you can't be the person you have. <laughs> and so he had all these ways of expressing it. And uh, so it ended up losing out. And people started saying, look, these have to be three different beings. They can't be the same being in three modes of existence. What makes the Trinity different from polytheism? 
Oh yeah, it depends who you ask. <laughs> I know I know a lot of opponents of Christianity to say today I say, look, I'm sorry, that's three gods. And um and it makes sense that you would say that because there are three persons who are all God. Christians insisted it was not polytheistic because there's only one God, but God is manifest in three persons. Um the Christians insisted even more strongly than Israelites and then early Jews on there being only one God. Um, and so they insisted that the Godhead is one. And the logic of it is that the three, even though they are distinct in number, they're not distinct in essence. They all have the same essence, the same substance, not in the way that you and I are both human, but in the way, but, you know, because we, we have huge differences uh, uh, as well. And, but the Godhead, the differences are more of function rather than essence. Uh, the essence is not different at all. It's all the same substance. So the Godhead is one substance manifest in three persons. So they, Christian theologians absolutely went out I mean, de defended monotheism. Who can we credit with the idea of the Trinity? Ah, so that's a complicated question. So the first person to use the term um, Trinity or to come up with that kind of terminology is this figure Tertullian uh, that I mentioned, um, who wanted to insist that there are three distinct beings, but only one uh, one God. He didn't, he didn't, he was writing it around the year 200 or so. Uh, a little before, a little after, around 200, he didn't have the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, he he used the term, and he really did believe that God was essentially one thing, and that there were three distinct persons who were God, but he didn't have the fully worked out doctrine as it came to be developed. That didn't happen until later times, until the fourth century. How was it received then when Tertullian first started talking about this idea? Was it a heresy? Was it pretty widely accepted? Uh, how did people respond? We don't really know. You know, for a lot of these early church theologians, what we really wish is that we had readers' reports on their writings. <laughs> like, you know, book reviews. Else, and book reviews. We wish they had book reviews, and we don't. But so, and there, and the problem is that the ones who were embracing the views that essentially became the established view, they're the ones whose writings were preserved. And so Tertullian had a lot of enemies and proponents, and he names them, um, but we don't have their writings. And so they obviously didn't agree with him, and they probably said nasty things about him like he did about them, and they probably had very you know, strong arguments, but we don't, we don't have them. So we don't know how they were received at the time. But eventually, for a number of historical reasons uh, and a lot of historical contingencies, one view ended up winning out. And then then these people who won these debates that we, we call the Orthodox Christians, um, or in this context, when you say orthodoxy, um, you're not actually meaning what the term technically means. Technically, the term orthodoxy means the correct belief. And when historians are talking about who's right and who's wrong. They're not really talking about who's right, who's wrong. It's not their historians who are studying ancient theology don't have any particular access to the Trinity other than anyone else. So they're not really saying that that's the right opinion. They're saying that's the opinion that became the dominant view, this orthodox view. And so this, this orthodox view as it developed later then, people who held that view claimed earlier predecessors and Tertullian would have been, would have been one of them. How then did it come to be orthodox teaching? Well, the the big the big moment in some ways uh, goes back to what we dealt with in our last uh, episode, the Emperor Constantine. Um, when the Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity, he had no idea how what he was getting into. I mean, he didn't. He, you know, I don't. I don't think he regretted it ultimately, but he had he had no conception of the complications involved with Christianity. And one of them was a theological controversy that he got deeply involved with. He did want to have a unified church, and the church was split over this issue about Christ's full divinity. Was Christ fully divine or not? This was a uh, it was a debate that um, that appeared in the uh, in the three. Well, it became a really serious problem in the three twenties, um, and um, so you know roughly you know ten years or so after Constantine's conversion, the deal is that there was a um, 
there's a very powerful church in Christianity uh, before Rome kind of was ruling everything uh, Alex in Alexandria, Egypt. Alexandria was understood to be a kind of intellectual capital of the ancient world. And it had an intellectual church there, a large Christian church. And um, there was a presbyter there, a, a, like a leader of the church, uh, one of the church leaders named Arius, uh, A-R-I-U-S. He had been asked by his bishop to, uh, he and his the other underlings to the bishop were asked to write, kind of explain their understanding of the relationship of the father and the son. Uh, how you know, how do you explain it that they're both God, but you know there's one God? Or how do you explain how do you explain how they relate basically? Um, and what Arius argued was he wrote out this thing, and what he argued was what most people probably thought at the time, which was that God the Father was he's he goes back all the way into eternity. At some point, God begot a son. He he the son came into existence at some point in the past. And the son is not equal with with God the Father. I mean, he you know he came into being. There was a time before which he did not exist, um, and so he so and he wasn't as powerful as God. God Christ is more powerful than us by an infinity infinity of power and glory, and and the Father is separated from the Son by an infinity of power and glory. And so you know so so he's a created being, came into being at some time, and he's subordinate to God. So they're both God. Christ is God. He created the world. He came into the world, died for the sins of the world. He ascended to heaven. He is complete. He is God, but he's a subordinate divinity. So that was that was a view that was very popular, and that he that that was very popular in Alexandria uh, at the time. How does it go from having this really really popular view to just the Trinity? What happens to, to Arian's idea? So Arius's idea that you know God Christ as a subordinate divinity was was popular, but there was another popular view that was actually represented by the Bishop of Alexandria that had asked him to do a write up. <laughs> the Bishop of Alexandria, uh, memorably enough, is named Alexander <laughs> at this time. A guy named Alexander who was a bishop, and he thought Arius was completely wrong. He did not think that Christ could be seen as a subordinate divine being. Christ, Jesus says things like, "I and the Father are one." in the Gospel of John. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so uh, Alexander wanted to argue that Jesus was not a subordinate divinity who came into being at some time. He actually was an eternal being like God the Father and was equal with God the Father in every way. He was as powerful as God the Father and as knowing as God the Father. And he was he was equal with God, not subordinate to God. And so that so that was Alexander's view, and it led to a big debate uh, in Alexandria. But then it, it became a big debate throughout the Christian world, and um, where people couldn't agree on the re- on the relationship between the Father and the Son. And some of the church fathers say this this argument happened on the streets, <laughs> and that it is like people were arguing about this issue, and um, and. That's what ends up leading then to a council that Constantine calls the Council of Nicaea. That was actually going to be my final question. What role did the Council of Nicaea play in kind of settling this issue? So um, Constantine realized that the church was split over this theological issue. Constantine did not think it was much of an issue. <laughs> he thought this is such a petty little thing. We have a we have a letter that he wrote to uh, Arius and Alexander where he says it's a trivial matter, and he says just just solve it. <laughs> he didn't Stop care. Stop squabbling. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Like, he's God. Does it matter? And so he, either way, he's God, right? And he created the world and he died for sins. Why do you, why? And so he didn't, he himself, Constantine was not, he was not a deep thinker. He was not a philosopher. He was not a theologian. And he didn't see the point. Um, but uh, the church was split over it. So he, he wanted the church unified. So he called the Council of Nicaea. This is the first they're called ecumenical councils in early Christianity. There are seven ecumenical councils. Ecumenical means that they involved the entire world. So they weren't just kind of local synods, you know, of, of one city or another, or one place or another. Like bishops from around the world were invited to come to the city of Nicaea in order to debate the issue of the relationship of the Father and the Son. Uh, this happened in the year 325 major date of a major event for Christianity. 
uh, over 300 bishops came from around the world uh, and they debated these issues with both sides being represented and alternate views being represented, mediating views being represented. And then they, then they made a decision. Um, Constantine called it. He, uh, he spoke at the conference. He was active uh, in the conference. He didn't make the decision himself. He, he, was, he didn't really care. Um, but the bishops there all cared. Um, and uh, contrary to what everybody hears, I need to, I need to clear up two th a couple of things about the Council of Nicaea. There are a couple of things that everybody hears that are wrong. Um, for one thing, uh, just to say this, uh, they did not decide what books would be in the New Testament. There was not a discussion about the canon of the New Testament at the Council of Nicaea. We have the proceedings, and it was not. This is not the not the issue. Is the relationship of the Father and the Son. The second thing is, it's not true that this is when people decided that Jesus would be God, uh, or as Dan Brown says in the Da Vinci Code, claiming it's a historical fact that this is when they decided Jesus would be the Son of God. <laughs> You just you wish Dan Brown would read the New Testament sometime. <laughs> like he's the Son of God everywhere. So everybody knew he was the Son of God, and everybody at the council knew he was God. They believed he was God. The question is, in what sense is he God? And the third thing is, uh, some people think well, it was kind of a close vote. It was not a close vote. Uh, virtually everybody ended up agreeing with Alexander, except for a handful of people. And Constantine then twisted some arms, and it ended up just. A very few couple people thought that agreed with Arius. Uh, and so the official decision then was that uh, Christ was equal with God and of the same substance uh, with God. And that initiated then uh, the development of the doctrine of the Trinity. So after the Council of Nicaea and Constantine has twisted his arms and everyone has, has made a vote, what happens next? Well, this is one of the great ironies of history that many people don't know about. Constantine died in 337, and one of his sons became uh, the emperor, uh, Constantius II. And Constantius II uh, was an Arian. He agreed with Arius. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then all these churches started becoming Arian again. And so that later, Jerome, Jerome the church father Jerome, uh, you know, at the end of the fourth, beginning of the fifth century, said that the world woke up and found itself Arian. <laughs> so, so, uh, so there's back and forths. There continued to be back and forths until finally, toward the end of the um, fourth century, there's another council that's called, and at that council, they they make a definitive ruling, and that becomes a thing that they're two, two are equal. And eventually, then you know, people start wondering about the spirit as well, because in the New Testament, Jesus says that he's going to leave, and another Comforter is going to come. Uh, and so that sounds like this is going to be, and the spirit's going to come. And he's going to, he's coming from God, and this is the spirit of God. And so people thought, well, the spirit as well is God. And so they ended up then with uh, with this idea that that you've got these these three. They're all God. They're distinct, but you can only have one God because the Bible says there's only one God. And so it's a way of reconciling the Bible with itself, right? The Bible says there's one God. The Bible says God is God, and Christ is God, and the Spirit is God. So how do you reckon? This is the doctrine of the Trinity, and it is not meant to be a mathematical equation, and it's not meant to make logical sense in the way we normally do. It's one of the mysteries of God. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to end it there uh, with God's greatest mystery, possibly. Yeah. Humanity's uh, most interesting incorrect mathematical equation. We're going to take a brief break and then we're going to be back with more information about the upcoming conference and we'll finish up with some listeners' questions. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ehrmanblog.org happenings and online course launches. I'm Bart Ehrman, and I'm excited to announce an unusual conference for anyone with the slightest interest in biblical studies. The conference will be called New Insights into the New Testament, a biblical conference for non-scholars. It'll be held over two days on September 23rd and 24. This conference will be a two-day virtual event for people who are interested in biblical scholarship but are not themselves scholars. The conference will include 10 lectures, 
each by a different established expert in the New Testament and each with a Q&A. Our theme will be the New Testament Gospels. I don't know of any conference like this ever. A series of lectures on the New Testament by established and acclaimed scholars directed to non-experts. Each lecture will present current scholarly insights in accessible terms to the general public. For this event, we've chosen 10 of the top scholars in the country, all of whom are highly adept at explaining the results of important and ongoing research in intriguing terms to the non-specialist. The lecturers include internationally known experts in numerous subfields of New Testament studies. Here's who we'll have. Amy Jill Levine is internationally known as a vibrant lecturer and an unusually astute scholar of Jesus and the Gospels. She's a professor of New Testament emerita at Vanderbilt Divinity School, a Jewish scholar training Christian ministers. Amy Jill is the first Jew to teach New Testament at Rome's Pontifical Biblical Institute. Dale Allison is an emeritus professor at Princeton Theological Seminary with numerous erudite publications used widely by scholars. He's recognized everywhere as a leading authority on the historical Jesus and the Gospels. Mark Goodacre, professor and chair of the Department of Religion at Duke University. Mark is internationally acknowledged as a leading expert on the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Our expert lecturers include public figures well known to the general public interested in biblical studies. Candida Moss is a professor at the University of Birmingham. She's a regular columnist for the Daily Beast and a prize-winning author on numerous topics related to the New Testament and early Christianity, whose work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic Monthly, Politico, CNN, and Slate. James Tabor has been a well-known public scholar for decades, who's written numerous books and is a frequent consultant for such venues as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Harper's, Vanity Fair, Der Spiegel, the London Times, and all the major news networks. Among our presenters are scholars who are challenging and transforming some of the orthodoxies of New Testament scholarship on the Gospels, including Hugo Mendez, my colleague in ancient Mediterranean religions at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, whose ongoing work is revolutionizing our understanding of the Gospel of John, undermining the orthodoxies that most of us were trained in and most of us have taught for decades. Robin Faith Walsh at the University of Miami has burst onto the academic scene with one of the most widely discussed works of biblical scholarship in years, which is meant to disrupt our scholarly view of the authors of the Gospels and their sources of information. We'll have brilliant scholars of New Testament manuscripts and archaeology who are highly active in both erudite scholarship and public discourse. Jennifer Knust, professor at Duke University, who has produced highly acclaimed books ranging from issues of sex and sexuality in early Christianity to the manuscript tradition of the New Testament, and who's widely regarded as one of the leading textual critics in the world today. And Jody Magnus, a distinguished professor at UNC Chapel Hill, who is arguably the best known and most prolific archeologist of Israel in the days of Jesus, with award-winning books on archeological issues connected with ancient Judaism, Jesus, and the New Testament. This is a pretty amazing lineup. I'll also be giving a talk on a topic that I've never presented on before. I'll be emceeing the event and running all the Q and A's for my colleagues. As I said, there's never been anything quite like this event in the history of biblical scholarship. Scholars of this caliber delivering results of their New Testament scholarship in understandable terms to an audience of non-specialists. You would expect an event like this to charge something like $500 for in-person attendance and maybe $150 for virtual. But this remote conference will cost only $59.95. 
And if you sign up by August 26th, the cost is just $49.95. In addition, if you purchase a ticket for the conference, whether or not you actually come, you'll be given lifetime access to the recordings that will include the lectures, the Q&As, and additional materials. You'll have no travel costs, no hotels, no personal expenses, just a series of lectures by true experts over two days, each of them followed by a live Q&A delivered to you in the comfort of your home. This is about as good as it can get. This is going to be an amazing event. I hope to see you there. Okay, so we are back at New Insights into the New Testament conference time. Um, we're going to talk about a couple more presenters that will be there. Uh, if you're not familiar with the conference, we've mentioned it a couple of times on the podcast. Um, it's going to be on the 23rd and 24th of September, entirely online. So you can sign up and kind of watch from the comfort of your own home. There will be 10 fantastic speakers. We went over two uh, last week, uh, Dr. Candido Moss and Hugo Mendez. And today we're going to be talking about James Table and Jody Magnus. Uh, Dr. Table is talking about moving the goalpost, Mark's sign of the end as a failed prophecy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So look, this this conference. Uh, if if you haven't heard the full spiel on this thing, you really need to look at it because because it's these are ten top scholars in the world who are presenting the, their scholarship to at a layperson's level, and there's nothing like it. There's never been anything like this that I know of, and so it's going to be really good. And so you got these presenters. I mean, so uh, J James Tabor is a um, for anybody who's interested in the Bible and New Testament studies and things. You, you may, you should have heard of James Tabor because he's a very, he's a well-known figure in this field and has been for a very long time. I've known him for probably almost 35 years. And he's written really uh, interesting and important work on Paul and on Jesus and the gospels. He's an archeologist who digs in in, in, his, in Jerusalem and, he, and he's a controversial figure. He was very involved with the uh, Branch Davidian thing at Waco. Uh, he wrote two books about that because he was involved with trying to negotiate with David Koresh. I mean, he's like, oh my God. So he's a really interesting guy. And so I, again, I don't know the content of what he's going to say, but, uh, but um, it sounds like the idea is that Mark's gospel is responding to the fact that the end didn't come. Uh, because even in Mark, Jesus predicts the end's going to come within his own generation and that his disciples will see the kingdom of God arrive. But when Mark's writing, it hadn't arrived yet. So how does how does Mark deal with that? How do you write a gospel about Jesus recording his words when you know that his words didn't come true? What do you what do you do? And so it sounds like this lecture is going to be about that, which will be interesting because James is a smart and uh, intelligent guy who comes up with creative solutions to things. So we'll we'll see. He's he's a fascinating speaker as well. So I think that one's yeah. going to be well. They're all going to be excellent. But no, that that sounds very interesting. And then we we've got Jodie Magnus as well. Uh, her title is "In the Footsteps of Jesus: Exploring Jerusalem's Sacred Sites." So I could you know we could spend a whole episode talking about Jodie Magnus. She she's an amazing person. She's my she's my colleague at UNC Chapel Hill, and she's she's arguably the best known uh, archaeologist of Israel from the time of Jesus in the world, um, and. She has a um, she has an annual dig, and she's you know actively digging still in in Israel. And every summer, every year, National Geographic um, covers her work uh, because of the, the this amazing synagogue that she's she's found. She's written three award winning books: one on the uh, the Dead Sea Scroll place Qumran, where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls; one on Masada, and one on Jerusalem. So she really knows all of this stuff, and so her. Um, one of her expertise, of course, is Jerusalem in the days of Jesus. She teaches an entire semester class on this at Chapel Hill, a very popular class. And so she's going to talk about some of the real sites, the, the very interesting and important sites, uh, because a lot of people have miscomprehension, misunderstandings of what these sites really were and what they are and, you know, how significant they are and why. And so, but she is, uh, she's also, she's one of these really dynamic uh, speakers, very, very, uh, everybody comes away from her and say, wow, that was amazing. <laughs> so I think that'll be good. I, th I think it's 
it's really nice to see there being an archaeological component because I, I feel that a lot of the time with biblical studies, Old Testament as well, you get this laser focus on the texts, yeah. which are, don't get me wrong, obviously very important, but these were written in and about real places and we have a lot of evidence and yeah. and the archaeology is just so fascinating. I think it's really, really important to, to yeah. try and have a, a good understanding of, of the sites that people are working with. Absolutely. It makes a huge difference. And so, yeah, so it's important, really, really important. So the conference is New Insights in the New Testament. It runs 23rd and 24th of September. There will be 10 fantastic speakers. Um, the cost is $59.95, but you can get the early bird pricing of $49.95 up until August the 26th. You can learn more and buy your tickets at www.ntconference.org. And we will be going over a couple more of the uh, speakers next week. But before that, we are going to do some more listeners' questions. Questions. Now it's time for questions from listeners, where Bart answers real questions submitted by misquoting Jesus fans. If you'd like to submit a question for future segments, please visit bartermancom slash askbart. Okay, we have a nice varied selection this week, Bart. First up, what evidence is there for the Catholic Mass in early Christianity? What form did it take? And do we know when and why Christians started to perform this ritual? Um, so uh, the Christian Mass refers to the, uh, the celebration of the, uh, of the Last Supper, uh, the Lord's Supper, as it developed uh, later in Christianity, where um, it came to be thought that when people uh, eat the, the bread at the meal and drink the wine uh, at the meal, that they are consuming the, the uh, body and blood uh, of Christ. And so in the Catholic Mass, for example, this is, this is, uh, this is what happens. Uh, the question is, when, you know, what root of, what's the root of that in the Bible? Uh, the Bible doesn't have uh, any theology about this, uh, this event per se, but the, but the celebration of the Lord's Supper in commemoration of the last meal of Jesus with his disciples is in the New Testament. It's discussed in several places. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have an account of it. Before them, Paul has an account of it in 1 Corinthians 11. Um, there, uh, there are lots of debates between uh, theologians about the significance of the meal for these early Christian authors, because the, um, the authors don't come out and say anything about the transformation or the, tra you know, the transformation, or the later called the transubstantiation, in which the, uh, the elements are transformed into Christ's literal body and blood. Um, and so the debates uh, have long been carried out between Protestants and Catholics, especially, where Protestants would say that uh, these elements are uh, commemorating Jesus' death, and, pro and Catholics saying, no, they actually become Jesus' death. They become his body and blood. And that's that's the big debate. Uh, my view of it is that the Mass itself and the theology connected with the Mass, with transubstantiation uh, and, and everything connected with it, is a much later development that you don't get until the uh, early Middle Ages, uh, but that um, the earliest understanding was that this was a commemorative meal to remember Jesus' death. Thank you. The next question is about the, the writers of the Gospels. Are the writers of the Gospels each from separate communities? And do we have any information on where these communities were geographically based? Um, almost certainly they were from different communities. Um, uh, we don't, they, they didn't know each other, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, whatever, whatever their names, actual names were, they didn't know each other. They, they almost certainly lived in different communities. Um, and we don't know which communities they were. There are, um, scholars have long speculated about one or another. Um, and so, for example, you know, people, people will often say things like Mark was written in the city of Rome, you know, or that Matthew was writing in the city of Antioch, or John was writing in the city of Ephesus. So they have these speculations and scholars come up with arguments for why this place or another place, but basically it's just guesswork. And, you know, when people state these things, assuredly, you think, really, you know, like you say, for example, well, Matthew shows that 
if you read Matthew's gospel carefully, and this is true, that there's a real conflict between the Jewish synagogue and the Christian community. So where would there be a large Jewish and a large Christian community? Uh, Antioch. <laughs> so, okay, Antioch. <laughs> or <Bingo>. other places. <laughs> and so I I don't think we actually know, other than they were all outside. I think they were all outside of, outside of Israel. Um, and it's somewhere in the in the Roman Roman Empire where they were speaking Greek and they it have to be in an urban setting, but we don't know where. Thank you. And we've got a, a fun one up next. Which Bible scholars, living or dead, would you invite to a dinner party? Um well I I don't need to invite living ones because I have dinner with them all the time. <laughs> I don't need it. I mean, so I, that's I, just I, a Friday night. I, I know just about all, you know <laughs> So uh, in terms of dead ones, man, yeah, well, okay. How about Albert Schweitzer to begin with? <laughs> that would be good. Um, uh, so there are a lot of big names uh, that would be great. I mean, Rudolf Boltmann was probably the most important New Testament scholar of the 20th century. Um, and he was, uh, he, was, he was quite amazing. My two heroes in the faith are not ones that normally come to mind for uh, biblical scholars. When I, I became enamored in uh, graduate school with uh, Fenton John Anthony Hort and uh, Brooks Westcott, uh, Brooks Foss West, yeah, Brooks Westcott. Um, and so Westcott and Hort were the ones who developed our Greek New Testament as we have it today, pretty much. So they were scholars of manuscripts. And so I'd love to have dinner with them. Thank you. And final question, fittingly, talking about manuscripts. The New Testament seems to have a richer and more complete set of manuscripts than any other text. As an Assyriologist, I'm taking issue with that statement. Do text critical scholars use patterns in New Testament copying as a template for predicting how other ancient texts with a sparser manuscript record would likely have been altered by copyists? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so you can detect scribal habits in uh, in the New Testament texts because you can see what kinds of mistakes repeatedly get made and figure out probably why they were made. But the, um, and I suppose in some ways, um, the study of manuscripts did um, come to prominence among scholars because of the New Testament, because in the with the invention of printing in the 15th century, you started having Bibles being produced and Bible publishers had to choose which manuscripts to put into print. And so once you realize that this manuscript and that manuscript have word these books differently, then you have to decide which manuscript. And eventually you get enough of these, you have to decide, well, okay, you're not going to choose one manuscript. You're going to figure out what the original wording was among these various manuscripts. And so that develops into this field of textual criticism. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of work that's been done as well in, in just every field. Every literary field um, has textual criticism. The classicists uh, deal with this kind of issue all the time. Um, it's interesting. Sometimes, I, sometimes I'll have a debate with a uh, evangelical scholar who's convinced that we know what the words of the New Testament are. And I'll explain why we, some places we just don't know, and we can't know because of the confusion of the evidence. And they'll sometimes say to me, these are scholars who will be saying this in public. And they'll say, well, yeah, but if you say that, you'd have to say th the same thing about Homer and Plato and, and Euripides. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Of course we say the same thing about Homer, Plato, and Euripides. That, don't you realize this is, Scholars devote their entire lives to this kind of thing. And so um, so the some of the tendencies we get in the New Testament manuscripts are absolutely like what you get in other manuscript traditions, especially accidental mistakes, the kinds of accidental mistakes that get made. The difference is that with the New Testament, the copyists were people who believed in these books uh, on re for religious reasons and sometimes altered the books because of their beliefs. And that doesn't happen very much with other ancient authors. Because uh, so that would be a difference, and that'd be a place where the New Testament stuff doesn't really affect the the other the other kinds of textual criticism that gets done. Wonderful, Bart. Thank you so much. And before we finish for the week, would you mind just summarizing what we talked about? So the topic today is, you know, arguably the the the, the most interesting and and 
misunderstood and important doctrine of Christianity, the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, there are Christians today, of course, who don't subscribe to the doctrine of the Trinity, but the traditional doctrine is very interesting to see how it progresses. It, the way it's not found in the Bible, it's, it develops later, and it, it doesn't come to complete form, to kind of its final crystallized form for, for centuries after the New Testament. But already in the second century, some almost all Christians are calling Jesus God, and so Christians had to decide how, how could Christ be God and God be God, and eventually they thought, well, they're, they're, they're equal to each other. Then the Spirit is added in. You've got three equal beings, but they wanted to insist there's only one God. And so we were talking about how that happened, how you end up with a doctrine that's a mystery that doesn't really make logical sense. They've got three persons, all of whom are God, and yet there's only one God. Thank you so much, Bob, for your time and expertise. As always, this was a fascinating conversation. Audius, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss future episodes. Remember also that you can use the code NJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses over at www.barterman.com. Misquoting Jesus will be back next week. Bart, what are we talking about next time? So next time, we're going to have kind of a logical follow-up for these last two uh, episodes we've had. We had one on Constantine's conversion, one on the development of the Trinity. And the question we're going to be dealing with is how did Christianity take over the Roman Empire? Uh, because it's connected with both of these things. And it's it's inherently an interesting question for me because it, it, it looks like Christian, according to the New Testament, Christianity started out of a very small group of people who believe Jesus got raised from the dead. 11 disciples, a handful of women, say 20 people believe this at first. And within 300 years, there are two or three million of them. And by the end of the fourth century, it's 30 million. How'd that happen? <laughs> that, that doesn't happen every day. And how, literally, how did it happen? That's what we'll be talking about. Thank you all and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday. So please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us.